Uh, my name is Dan DeGuar. I'm the superintendent of Belmont Redwood Shores School District. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our panel discussion this afternoon regarding reopening schools safely in the era of COVID-19. I'd like to thank you for joining us. We've assembled a very distinguished panel of medical health and education experts to share their thoughts about COVID-19 and safely educating our children. Uh, before we start, I wanna extend my heartfelt thanks to our guests for the work that they do day in and day out to serve our community and for the essential services that they provide. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your efforts to spend time with us today and I'm extremely honored to introduce uh, our panelists uh, to the community. Uh, first, we have uh, Naomi Bardak, Bardak an associate professor, professor of pediatrics and policy in the Department of Pediatrics and the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health, Health Policy Studies at the University of California at San Francisco. Uh, she's the vice chair of health services research in the Department of Pediatrics. She is an expert in school reopening and the many considerations needed and a thought leader in this area. Welcome, uh, Dr. Bardak. Uh, welcome, Dr. Nicole Ketterman. Dr. Ketterman, Ketterman is a passionate and thoughtful community pediatrician at Palo Alto Medical Foundation in San Carlos. She is a member of the local American Academy of Pediatrics School Health Committee and has advised several neighboring school districts and the San Mateo County Office of Education on safe school reopening. Welcome, Dr. Ketterman. And my close colleague, uh, Nancy McGee, welcome, uh, Nancy. Uh, superintendent McGee, is a, she's a superintendent of San Mateo County Schools since 2018. Uh, superintendent McGee serves on the first five San Mateo County Commission, the Housing Endowment and Regional Trust of San Mateo County Board, uh, the Home for All uh, San Mateo County Steering Committee, and the Big Lift Leadership Team. Uh, Superintendent McKee is the co-chair of the San Mateo County Child Health Partnership Council, and she's been a leader in the county uh, school districts during the pandemic and a thought leader for reopening schools. Uh, welcome, Superintendent McGee. Uh, next is Dr. Dana Clutter. Dr. Clutter is an adult infectious disease physician at Kaiser Permanente in South San Francisco. She brings the adult medicine perspective of COVID infection in the hospital and community setting. Uh, Dr. Kletter has advised several neighboring school districts on safe school reopening. Welcome, Dr. Kletter. And uh, finally, uh, Dr. Mercedes Kwiatkowski. Uh, Dr. Kwiatkowski is a passionate pediatric psychiatrist and physician leader at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation in San Carlos. Uh, Dr. Kwiatkowski is the chair of behavioral health for PAMP. She brings the important perspective regarding the mental health of children as it relates to the pandemic and school reopening. I wanna welcome um, our panel. Thank you for joining us. And tonight we're fortunate to have also two uh, distinguished moderators. I'd like to welcome Dr. Neil uh, Patel and Dr. Jim Howard. I'm incredibly grateful to both of them as they've worked exceptionally hard to help organize uh, this panel this afternoon. Dr. Neil Patel is a community pediatrician and leader at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, also at San Carlos. Uh, he serves as the medical advisor to the pandemic recovery framework for San Mateo County Office of Education and is a regional representative uh, for the American Academy of Pediatrics and School Health Committee and a first five commissioner for San Mateo County. Uh, welcome, Dr. Patel. And finally, our, our local Dr. Jim Howard. Uh, he is a pediatri pediatric intensive care physician at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital at Oakland and a member of the Board of Trustees for the Belmont Redwood Shores School District. Uh, he's caring for children with COVID in the hospital setting, and he is enthusiastically committed to every student here in the Belmont Redwood Shores School District. And with that, um, I will turn it over to our moderators, Dr. Howard and Dr. Patel. Okay, so I think we're going to jump right into this. There's a lot of ground to cover, and we're very um, fortunate to have this panel. And I want to thank everybody who has taken the time to spend uh, with us this afternoon. Um, so we'll start uh, with this opening exercise for the panelists. 
Um, so to the panelists, for the following questions, please vote with your hand uh, by putting uh, one to five fingers up visibly on your screen. Um, hopefully that is simple enough instructions to follow. So the first question is, can you rate your level of concern for the safety of students and teachers in school? One to five. <laughs> Dr. Bardak is thinking about it. I know this is very academic of me, but it kind of depends. All <laughs> 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 we're in the middle, three-ish, two-ish, three-ish, so four-ish, two to four, three. depending on where what's going on. Okay, so I saw threes, I see fours. Um, can you rate how comp? Second thing, can you rate how complicated the process of reopening school will be during this constantly changing pandemic? Five, <laughs> five, five. <laughs> So this is a simplistic exercise, but the purpose of this exercise is to quickly see that we do all want the best for our students and for our teachers. Um, but this is definitely not a simple problem to solve. And I think the conversation today will highlight that. And we hope to have really meaningful dialogue that is um, informative and enjoyable. I wanna thank the panelists who have graciously given us their time to be with us and help us understand this ever-changing world during the pandemic. Um, in today's panel, which has a special focus for educators. You'll be hearing from medical experts who have learned a lot about COVID and we continue to learn more. They are advocates for the health and safety of children in the community and share a special sense of purpose and responsibility to lift our students and teachers to a point that uh, reopening can be implemented safely. None of them pretend that this will be easy and understand that this is a long-term endeavor. The purpose of our discussion today is to seek input from them about COVID related issues in school reopening. We acknowledge that data and information about children is hard to access and is constantly changing. So we bring experts in public health, community pediatrics, um, academic pediatrics, child mental health, infectious disease, and our own county superintendent who all have been working with or studying the data. They are not here to push a particular agenda they are all members of the community with a particular expertise and they have no direct affiliation to the Belmont River Shore School District. Prior to this event, teachers were surveyed and asked to submit questions. During today's panel, we ask that you listen to the panelists' thoughts and recommendations based on the questions that we received. At the end of this event, there will be a link provided to submit questions after today's presentation. We have learned that this is a better alternative to the chat um, questions which will be turned off during this panel discussion. All the questions received from educators were reviewed and they were divided into eight categories, mental health, public policy, vaccines, campus behaviors, latest information about SARS-CoV-2 virus, transmission, testing and mitigation. So we have a lot of ground to cover. We know we will not get to every question and um, as much as, we, and those that we can't get to will be posted on some sort of FAQ format afterwards. We will spend roughly seven to eight minutes in each area to give you a sense of how quickly this conversation will go. Um, so a very warm welcome to all of our panelists. At this point, I can't help but celebrate the distinguished set of leaders who have agreed to join us. You bring expertise, um, diversity, and a profound point of view to the panel. So please sit back and enjoy the discussion that is about to unfold. To the speakers, it is safe to agree. And I also wanna say that it's also safe to disagree. Uh, the first time you speak, please introduce yourself um, again and where you're from. So let's dive right into it. I'm gonna turn it over to Jim to start the first category. Yeah, so um, the first category we're gonna start off with is mental health. And uh, looking at the questions that uh, were received uh, in this area, uh, it seems to me that we were uh, being posited to comment on three different things. Um, the issue of moral distress, uh, the issue of anxiety relative to uh, teaching in this environment and really the, the impact of ongoing fatigue. Um, and so Dr. Kwiatkowski, um, I have two questions for you. Um, and question number one is uh, what has been the impact of distance learning on the mental health of students and teachers? Will hybrid, uh, hybrid learning make a difference? And question number two, uh, and this is a little bit more complex. Um, I feel like I see people in my community not following safety protocols. People are not always wearing masks. 
or social distancing and the impact of these actions make me very anxious, making it difficult for me to envision working on campus. What can I do to better cope with non-compliance? Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm Mercedes Kwiatkowski, just as a reminder, I'm a child, adolescent and adult psychiatrist at Palo Alto Medical. I'm really grateful to be here and I'm so glad we're having these conversations. They are difficult. And my motto this year has been, there are no easy decisions right now. Um, you know, as far as to speak to the first one, I feel privileged that I work with children and teenagers and also adults. So I have patients dealing with school issues and adult patients who are teachers dealing with the same thing. So I feel like I can speak to the gamut. Um, I think we would all agree that distance learning has been a challenge for our students. Um, and that's in spite of teachers' heroic efforts doing the best they can in really unprecedented work environments that are very stressful. So I think that's important to acknowledge. The things I'm seeing in the students are things like what I would call Zoom zombies. By the end of the day, they're kind of staring blankly, they're disengaged. They're turning off their cameras. Um, they're not really awake or alive anymore in a meaningful way. They kind of need that break. Um, but then the only way to connect with friends is also online. So they're just getting a lot of that screen time exposure. The other big thing I worry about, especially in the younger kids, is loneliness. I think for a lot of them, this one of the biggest parts of their development is engaging with peers and learning how to navigate things in the playground and how to share and how to communicate and that's really hard to do online. And we have a lot of data that shows that the longer we feel lonely, the more likely we are to be depressed and anxious. And I think that also applies to grownups too. I'm, you know, I'm lonely, I miss my friends. So it's just as hard for the adults. And I'm sure a lot of our educators miss the camaraderie of each other talking about how hard it is to manage the classroom and what do you do in this situation and how are you teaching this lesson plan? So a lot of that is just missing um, in the distance learning environment. Um, as briefly speaking to the educational losses, we have some data in California right now showing that there's about a five to 10 point gap from where students are this year compared to last year. Um, so it's not saying that students aren't learning, they're just learning slower than they normally would. Um, so that's something I think we need to pay attention to. There's attendance issues, students turning off their cameras, not participating, not logging in. So there's just a lot we don't know right now about that. There's concern for child abuse and reporting is actually down up to 70% in most counties. Um, but what we're seeing in the ERs is indicating that doesn't mean there's a drop in abuse, but just not as many reporters and mentors involved in these kids' lives that might be observing things that are concerning. So I, you know, I could go on and on about the students. I think it's so important to acknowledge, you know, parents have a lot of mental stress and the teachers, this is unprecedented work environment. And it's, I imagine really hard to feel like I'm doing the best I can and is that enough, you know, and what else can we do in that situation? So I really empathize um, with that kind of, kind of chronic anxiety and then not knowing about the future and what's to come. Um, so I guess that's what I've seen. So I, I do have some patients who are in private schools and they have been back doing a hybrid learning experience. Um, and I have friends and colleagues and patients who are teachers who've also had that experience. And overwhelmingly, there is initial huge anxiety for everyone. You know, like, what's this gonna look like? How do I, how do I engage on a campus? You know, what if people aren't following the rules? And it's been overwhelmingly pretty positive experience on, on all sides. Um, in fact, I've had some students who over the break, they, they were distance learning for a couple of weeks because the school wanted to make sure people were traveling or not. And the parents were like, oh my gosh, I forgot how hard distance learning is because we've been so used to this hybrid model where they get to engage on campus two or three days a week. And this is really challenging and the kids hate it. And I reached out to some teachers to get their perspectives and they've said, you know, it's a lot of work to do the hybrid it is. I think we all acknowledge that it's a ton of work, but they, they say it's worth it because they get to know the kids better. They're in the classrooms, even though they have to respect the, all the different parameters with the spacing, they just get a better feel for the students. They can tell when kids are keeping up and when they're not. They feel it's more rewarding for them because they kind of get that sense of excitement. They can see their kids learning and, and making gains instead of tiny faces on the screen. I can pause there as far as the distance learning um, and all that to say, like I, I voted a five on the complicated part and I know we'll get to that later. <laughs> um, as far as um, when people are not compliant, I think 
we all experience that. I haven't gone to Target because I know there might be a lot of non-compliance there. Not, no offense to Target, but I think the nice thing about school campuses is, is there is some control there. We have the four pillars. There are going to be a lot of rules and parameters that will keep us safe. And there's layers to that. So if you know, one small thing happens, you know, a mask slips off a face for a few seconds. There is also the distance and the hand washing. So we have all these different layers so that we can feel protected. I think an important part is for teachers to feel like they trust um, their schools and that they feel like my school really does care about my safety and wants me to be as protected as possible. So that's a really key component from my perspective. Um, and then as we remind ourselves with anxiety, we can only control what we can control. So let's really take advantage of that, right? And you know, I think we worry about kids being back in school, but they're very resilient. And if we give them pretty clear and consistent directions, they're actually pretty good at following it, especially if it means they get to see their friends. You know, we've, we've seen evidence of that in some of the other districts that have been back. The students really are following the rules. They're keeping their distance, they're wearing their masks. So I say that also as a sign of reassurance that this can be done in a safe way. Thank you, Dr. Kwiatowski, for your perspective. Can I add um, something, Neil? Just please. A, a different, sort of a different lens on the anxiety for the adults. Um, I want to just, I'm Nancy McGee, County Superintendent, but what I want to say to the community listening is I spent 20 years in the classroom as a high school English teacher. So I really, really understand how school campuses work um, and how, how some people do what they're supposed to do and some people don't. But the other piece that I bring to this conversation is as sort of a, um, an expert in school emergencies, right? And um, one thing that I started saying right at the beginning of the pandemic is that we're basically in an emergency and um, it's, a, it's a very slow burning emergency. Usually if a house catches on fire, it burns, you know, you take in the destruction and the loss and you begin the recovery process. But in a pandemic, the emergency continues day after day after day after day. And so it's like being on an emergency roller coaster, right? And in emergencies, our brains operate differently. So when you talk about trauma and what is happening in your brain, how much of your, um, you know, the, the best part of your brain, I'm, not, I'm obviously not the doctor here, the best part of your brain isn't always able to access itself, right? Because it's, it's worried about the survival mode. And so we're still, to all you teachers, we're still in an emergency. And it's important for us to be self-aware about what that's doing to our bodies and how our trauma is impacting the way we think and feel. Um, we were advising about that at the beginning of the pandemic. And here I am, you know, almost 10 months later, really saying the same thing and meaning it just as in, in, in urgently. Thank you, Nancy. Superintendent McKee. So next, I'd like to move to the next uh, category. And I'm sorry, it almost feels like we could go on for any one of these categories, but we will move the conversation along because there's so much good ground to cover. So the next area is in public policy. Um, Superintendent McGee, uh, there are two questions for you. How is San Mateo County tracking and reporting both community and in-school spread of COVID-19? Is the County Office of Education reporting positive cases in schools to the public? And the second one is a, a little bit of a more granular question. Are there going to be an ex any expectations around teachers needing to come to campus um, for teachers that are, that are teaching, that choose distance learning? So first of all, the first public policy piece is the role of the County Office of Ed. We are a guidance and technical support agency. So every district has its own leadership, its own school board, its own superintendent and cabinet. So, um, teachers will follow the direction of their local leaders. Um, honoring local control in this environment, it has been really important because some communities have prioritized getting kids back to school sooner because they've had resources uh, or less spread or whatever it might be. Other communities feel like they can't make that move for the same kinds of reasons. And all of them are right and all of them are okay. So the local decisions of the school communities is huge. There is, there can be no 
countywide um, like mandate. Um, the governor has the power to mandate those actions potentially. I don't even know, but if anybody has it, it would be uh, the governor. Secondly, um, you know, maybe you need to repeat the second question, Neil, because I. Oh, it was a simple. I, I think you, you so the first one you were addressing about uh, reporting, but the, it was oh, just reporting data. Yeah. So let me just speak to the data. Um, every school district is following our pandemic recovery framework for contact tracing, testing and contact tracing. And that we've been completely collaborating with county health all the way through. So every positive case in a school gets reported immediately to county health. Um, we're using largely, uh, many of us are using curative as our testing um, and their data automatically goes into the state system, the Cal Ready system. Um, so, uh, many of the districts that are open are putting up their own dashboards and that's the best way to do it. Again, the local control, they can confirm, uh, what their actual numbers are. People are, the school districts are calling and reporting to the county office and we're keeping a spreadsheet, but it's only to, uh, assess trends. We're not keep holding ourselves accountable because all that data is going to the county health department and to the state. So um, we support all the districts who are in person that are putting up a local dashboard. And then uh, Naomi might know more, or Dr. Bardak may know more about the, uh, the state dashboard that's planned. Okay, and turn it over to uh, Jim for Dr. Howard for vaccines. Um, maybe I'll, I can oh. hop in and just comment about the oh, state dashboard if you want. Yeah. Um, so I'm Naomi Bardak. I'm associate professor of uh, health policy and um, pediatrics at UCSF. I also got deployed in early December to um, serve at the state to lead the um, uh, state team uh, focusing on school safety for all uh, that got announced a week or two ago by Governor Newsom. So um, in that role, I, I, I have been talking to people a fair amount about the, um, you know, how can we create some transparency and a better understanding of what's going on on the ground. Um, I think that that the plan of helping to support schools to do reopening sort of has four different pillars. Um, and the pillars are actually supposed to s sort of be very interconnected because, you know, the pillars include funding, technical assistance, transparency, um, additional safety support, and then sort of uh, enforcement or, or accountability. And it's the transparency piece that's, you know, a super helpful piece for people to understand transparency about whether or not uh, schools are open in their area actually is very helpful for people to understand. Um, and in the neighboring areas, because there's a lot of confusion about, you know, who's open, who's not open. What does it mean? Why is my school open or not open? Um, and then also there's uh, the transparency around ca cases on school sites, as well as actually the, the, the other really important safety um, information that we're trying to also help people report on is whether or not there's been transmission on the school site. Because we know that there's going to be cases that are in school communities, a student or a teacher or a staff member who might have COVID-19, but it, it often, often it actually happens in the community. That's actually sort of what the evidence is showing is that most of those cases happen in the community. What we really wanna make sure that we're aware of is whether or not they're happening, a, a transmission is happening on a school site. And all those layers of mitigation are trying to actually help prevent that on-site transmission. Um, and so that's, that's, the, that's the data we're really trying to get at. We're also 100% um, gonna uh, report on those, just the cases in general but that's the other sort of piece that we're looking for. And that dashboard is, as many things are sort of in progress, but it looks like we're, we'll be, you know, aiming towards getting that data in the next month or two, hopefully, so. Thank you, Dr. Bartek. Yeah. We're gonna move on to vaccines, which was a very popular uh, topic on our um, pre-meeting uh, survey. Uh, and so I'm going to lead off with Dr. Clutter in this in this case. Uh, so uh, one of the questions uh, that received um, was if I receive the vaccine, but I am subsequently exposed to COVID, will it be possible for me to carry and spread the virus? 
is it known yet whether or not I can still be, you can still be infected with and spread the virus even after having both doses of the available vaccines? Uh, so I'm Dana Clutter. I'm an adult infectious diseases physician from Kaiser South San Francisco. Thanks for having me. Um, so that is a, an excellent question. And um, I wish I had a very solid answer for you. Unfortunately, it's still, um, it's still uh, unclear. Um, it's an important question because if the vaccine is 100% um, protective from infection, um, then it has uh, huge implications in terms of the ability to transmit, like the, the question is asking. And um, with, uh, you know, a, a significant mitigation and transmission could result in uh, fewer cases, fewer deaths. Um, there was a modeling study out of Washington that sh was uh, suggesting that if the, if the vaccine were found to be 100% protective from infection um, and consequently transmission, that there could be a 60% reduction in, um, in uh, death, cases and deaths in, in future surges. So, you know, that would be wonderful if it were that protective. Um, but we don't have a solid answer yet. Um, there have been some kind of proposed ways that we could look at this. Um, it's, it's a little tricky. Uh, one, one way to look at it would be um, what's called a human challenge study, where you um, have a group of, they estimate you need about 100 young, healthy uh, people, uh, young, young people, obviously, who are going to be not uh, at risk for severe disease, and you would you know, potentially inten intentionally infect them with um, COVID. Um, half the group having received, you know, two doses of vaccine, half the group having received placebo and just kind of, you know, swab, put them in isolation, swab routinely, see what happens. That's complicated ethically. So, you know, it's uh, un unclear if that's um, ever going to happen, but um, an alternative that's been propo proposed that seems more um, doable would be to look at kind of a high risk group like university students and um, vaccinate, you know, half of them. Uh, don't vaccinate the air, we'll give placebo to the other half and just kind of watch how the virus uh, naturally circulates and then kind of um, extra extrapolate based on that. So that's kind of a proposed way to look at this. Um, that's, we don't have any results from anything like that yet. Um, uh, and not sure kind of where that is in uh, studies like that are in development, but th those have been discussed. Um, there is a little bit of preliminary data um, that was uh, released by Moderna. And they uh, indicated that there was, uh, the vaccine resulted in a, um, and again, I just wanna preface this, this is um, incomplete preliminary data, um, but there, there's a hint that it may be protective um, in the incomplete preliminary data, they're suggesting maybe a two thirds reduction um, in, um, in kind of uh, asymptomatic uh, infection or in transmissions, I'm sorry. So, um, so that would be good, the, you know, that's, that's good. It, so I think that's uh, positive and that it shows that the vaccine did have an impact on, um, on um, trans on infection. Uh, on patients actually getting infected, in addition to what we know it does, which is reduce um, symptomatic COVID. We know that both Moderna and Pfizer are extremely effective, both over 90% effective in reducing cases of symptomatic COVID. Um, this little kind of tidbit of data that we have is, um, is uh, gives us some hope that it may also um, uh, reduce rates of infection as well, um, which would be great. Um, it did show also that it's not perfect and that um, there were some patients who got vaccine um, who, um, who were asymptomatic, uh, who had an infection and were asymptomatic. So that's, you know, something to keep in mind. And that's, um, 
one of the key pieces of advice to everyone who's been vaccinated is that you still have to do all of the things that you've been doing, you know, masking, distancing, hand hygiene, avoiding gatherings. You still have to do all of those things because there is still the, um, there's still likely risk of some um, transmission despite the great protection um, in, uh, in terms of getting symptomatic COVID. Um, so we still have to do those things. And, and it's, you know, it's very effective in, pro in pr protecting against um, symptomatic COVID, but um, it's, it's also not perfect. So, you know, there were some cases of um, symptomatic COVID. So, you know, for both of those reasons, um, to pre prevent against asymptomatic transmission and symptomatic COVID, it's still important to adhere to those um, principles of, uh, of uh, mitigating spread, so. So that's um, really helpful information to understand. Um, the, uh, the other thing that comes up often is, uh, this is a different kind of vaccine. Um, the ones that we have available right now are mRNA vaccines. And um, right now the, the approach is not a single dose, but uh, you're required to get a second shot um, 21 to 28 days later. So how important it is, is it to give, to get that second vaccine dose in that window, number one. And number two, uh, there's talk of a, a, a new strain out there uh, that's uh, causing the UK to shut down and uh, uh, things such as that. And so um, is there any difference in the available vaccines and their ability to protect uh, against uh, the new variant of, of COVID? Um, do you have any insight into that? Yeah, so in terms of, um... Um, protecting against the new variant of COVID, um, the, the UK variant, um, the, I believe it was um, Pfizer um, actually just released um, data um, about how their vaccine performs in vitro um, uh, against the UK variant. Um, so they looked at Sierra from people who had been vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine. Maybe, and can they, I just suggest, oh, sure. maybe translate, translate for a lay audience, maybe? I think the lay audience might know, know, not know what um, Sierra or in vitro means. Oh, thank you. Okay. No worries. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Listening with my teacher ear. <laughs> yeah, thanks. My nerdy um, ear is very excited, though. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, so they took blood from people who had been vaccinated uh, with the Pfizer vaccine. And um, they looked at uh, kind of the antibody responses in the blood and uh, tried to determine how effective those antibody responses were um, in neutralizing both kind of the wild type COVID and the uh, UK variant. And it was basically the same. So that's, that was in a test tube kind of setting. That's what in vitro is kind of like in a test tube. So this, this hasn't been shown in humans, but in, in, the, in the lab, it looks like there's not a huge reason to be concerned. Um, you know, we, we won't know, I think, with 100% certainty until we see this vaccine actually kind of performing in human populations, protecting them from, you know, the UK, the UK strain. But, you know, this, this is promising. And I think, um, uh, I think, you know, uh, um, fortunately, the uh, body's immune response to a vaccine is often kind of polyclonal. So you kind of, well, you, so um, multifaceted, meaning you um, make lots of different kinds of antibodies. So even if there's kind of mu a mutation over here, probably all the antibodies you made over here might, you know, do some work, some, you know, keep the virus under control. So that's kind of what we're hoping and thinking. And this um, lab experiment kind of suggested that it's probably going to be okay. So, so that's, that's uh, all um, relatively good news, I'd say. So that was Pfizer did that experiment and put out those results. Um, I, you know, we don't have reason to believe that Moderna is going to behave all that differently. They just haven't, um, as far as I know, um, uh, yet put out that same kind of study. But, you know, we anticipate that it, 
uh, that'll uh, hopefully remain effective against uh, against the UK strain. Um, so that was that was one part, and then the timing of the of the vaccines. Um, so uh, the the studies were designed with those intervals. So the, the you know the twenty one days for Pfizer, twenty eight days for Moderna. That that was the study design, and so the results that we have that show how effective they are are based on that interval. Um, so to kind of uh, uh, have the highest odds of achieving that good um, uh, success, uh, that degree of protection, I would stick with how they did it in the study. Um, you know, it might be just as good if you do it a little bit later. I'm not sure. I imagine they have kind of a lot more data on kind of the ideal time to do it. Um, but what we know from the study is that that, that worked. Um, so probably good to just kind of stick with that. It's kind of typical to allow a four day grace period um, with a lot of vaccines. And so that's, um, you know, th there is that four day grace period here. Um, we often kind of worry about if you give the second dose um, way too soon, then you might have kind of compromised efficacy. Um, you might have kind of a uh, decreased response to the vaccine. Um, but of oftentimes we think of giving it later as being kind of not as bad as giving it um, mu much too soon in terms of the response you might expect. So. The short answer is uh, the study did it that way. We know that the study worked. So try to kind of do what they did in the study to get those same results. Great. All right, thank you so much. Um, I have um, a policy uh, question related to the vaccines. Um, and this is probably best for Dr. Bardak and uh, Dr. McGee. Um, in, or, I'm sorry, uh, Superintendent McGee. Um, uh, in California, when will educators and school systems be offered the opportunity to receive uh, the vaccines and how will they be distributed? Um, that's number one. And uh, number two, which may be more of a, um, which will be an interesting question at some phase. Uh, will teachers be required to be immunized against COVID-19 in order to return to work on campus? Uh, and will staff, uh, how will staff be prioritized? Uh, so let's start with the first question. Um, when will the vaccine be offered uh, to, or when will folks that are educators be offered the opportunity to receive the vaccine? Um, do we have any insight into that uh, time frame? Um, I can, I can give some something of an answer, um, and then maybe Superintendent McKee can also um, talk to people about what what you've been hearing also because I'm not sure how things have been what kind of messages have, have gone out um, I in my role actually I'm not right at the table right now for vaccine for understanding the the uh, schedule for vaccine distribution um, part of that is because the vaccine distribution is a little bit um, you know uh, the rate limiting step or the 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 reason why we can't say for sure when it's going to happen is because um, the supply chain is not actually flowing perfectly right now. So the there's a high, you know, teachers are considered a very, very high priority. Teachers and staff, school staff, anybody on the school campus who's an adult, because kids are not eligible to get a vaccine that hasn't been tested in them yet, but everybody on the, uh, all adults on the school campus, high priority, essential workers, essential to have, um, to have schools be able to function and 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 have that population be protected, um, so definitely a high priority. But because there's also other prioritized populations even before the teacher population, and the supply chain is not perfectly clear right now, that's why there's no like okay, we know for sure on this date the teachers will start getting vaccinated. Um, and then there's one other piece, which is that there might be some variation around the state where some counties might have fewer essential workers in other categories like so there's there's you know a set category 1a and then 1b teachers are in 1b but there's a lot of different types of people in 1b not just teachers and, and um, school staff and so it might be that some counties have not very many of those other people like firefighters and um, 
other frontline workers. And so then a teacher in one county might get vaccinated a little bit earlier than teachers in a different county that have more of those other essential workers, just depending on how the variation is. So that's just um, to, you know, I, I think it's helpful in particularly in a world where we don't, where you, we, there's no date that we can say for sure it's going to happen. I think it's helpful for people to understand what are the deciding factors or what are the things that are kind of determining the, the, um, the pace at which the vaccine is rolling out right now for teachers and for uh, school staff. Uh, yes, and I would um, confirm that um, just yesterday I was on a call, a statewide call with all the county superintendents and some counties are already um, distributing, able to distribute a vaccine to educators because they're in that um, 1B tier one category and they're smaller counties that don't have as many 1A folks to get to. In San Mateo County, um, this week, the county health department is sponsoring a drive-through vaccination setting at the fairgrounds at the can I um, to uh, finish the vaccines of the 1A group. So they're making a huge effort to close up the 1A vaccines. Um, so, and then I was on a call with all the Bay Area health officers yesterday, and the main. Um, comment I took away from them is that uh, the supply is constricted. So because the supply is constricted, we can't make significant plans, but we can, but what we do know is that um, educators are next and it's coming soon enough. And um, I am working with the, with the district superintendents to establish criteria for priorities within the K, TK-12 system. Um, and, uh, and then we're trying, we're working on different ideas about how we might, um, distribute the vaccine to educators, but that's going to require big partners like, um, our medical communities like Kaiser to partner with us at the County Office of Ed. So the, all those things are still, um, brewing and, um, we have some good ideas and some, um, I think uh, some good plans, but they're not quite ready to um, share out. There, there's nothing in place yet. And uh, the the last question was: um, uh, Will uh, teachers be required to be immunized to be on campus? Uh, yeah, uh, I suspect right. that gets into uh, both local and uh, county policy. Yeah, initially no, um, because there's no legislation um, to support that. But um, do know that educators must uh, have a TB test and show proof of negative TB results in order to be on a school campus. And it's possible that um, eventually the education policy conversation could go there. Um, but I think it'll take a little bit of time for that to evolve. Fair enough. Uh, Neil, should we move on to the next uh, topic? Sure. So the next topic is uh, campus environment and behaviors. And for this, I have a question for Dr. Ketterman. Um, I'm gonna combine two questions. So basically in the vision, it, once teachers start to get vaccinated and if we, and when we return back to school, can you, uh, the question really stems to the ability of, of children, um, more so children, but then also, also adults to follow the mitigation behaviors. So the first question is, I think it's already been discussed, do we need to continue those mitigation behaviors? And what is your confidence that, that children, that students will be able to do that? Um, yeah, uh, good question. So, um, so I'm Nicole Ketterman, I'm a pediatrician at PAMP in San Carlos. Um, so we've seen a huge evolution in kids' ability to maintain these measures. You know, in the beginning of the pandemic, we, even the AAP was like, oh, young kids, I don't think, I think wearing masks are more trouble than are worth. And then we've learned and we've seen that the kids are doing a really great job, oftentimes better than <laughs> some of their adults. So it's, it's really impressive um, watching these young kids um, learn how to wear a mask and it's becoming second nature, like a seatbelt or a helmet when you're riding a scooter or something like that. So I, I am very confident in their ability to do it. Um, I do think having a culture like creating a culture of safety from the school from even before you go back I'm sure it's already started um but you know it's, you know from the principals and the, the local school community you know 
being sure that we're emphasizing the importance of following all these mitigation strategies and not gathering and wearing our masks and, and social distancing and so forth. And, um, and that really sets a good example for the kids and the kids are going to have so many examples with uh, for them at school with all the teachers and staff wearing masks. Um, so I don't think it's going to be, um, I don't think the idea is going to be difficult for them. I do think that for especially some of the kids that haven't been out of the house much since the pandemic started, like there will be a learning curve and there will need to be, you know, reminders and praise for their like efforts of keeping their mask on and, and maybe some posters of like how to wear a mask well over our nose and mouth and making it fun for them. At this point, I don't think a mask is scary for anyone. I mean, for I, I wouldn't expect most kids to be scared of the mask. And I think that they can easily learn the rules and, um, and, and, um, and follow them. I think they're gonna be super stoked to be at school. And so um, they'll be willing to do it if they can stay. Can I add um, to that? Is that no, okay? Please. No. Please. I was just going to share, uh, to add to that, I think kids feed off of our energies. You know, anyone here who has children, they know if we're stressed, they're suddenly stressed and then the whole house, you know, so if we approach it, you know, just like when you take your kids to get a shot, you say, oh, it's going to hurt for a second, it's going to be fine, and then we'll go get ice cream or something. We have to have the same approach, a lot of reassurance, positivity, you know, this is our way to get to school and, and all the teachers have it and the staff and all your friends. And so it's all about the way that we deliver the message and having the clear, concise guidelines. And I think kids will be totally fine with that. And I, I can add to just um, the superintendents who've opened schools for hybrid learning. Um, the biggest thing they've reported is the joy <laughs> that is present on the campus and how deeply grateful the kids are to be there. Um, how amazing the kids have been in following the protocols. Um, these have not been the challenges that they've had to work through. Um, and I have, if, if I had heard a, you know, a report otherwise in some way, I would report that. But um, we just are not hearing that is part of the, any part of the uh, challenge for return. Wonderful. We'll move on to information about COVID. Dr. Howard. Yeah, so um, this one, I'm gonna start off with uh, Dr. Bardak again. Um, and this has to do with the new variant of COVID-19 that we've seen in the news. Um, does it more easily infect children? And is it easy, more easily spread by children? Uh, and generally speaking, how likely are children to contract and spread COVID-19 compared to adults? Uh, maybe I'll start with the first one, with the last one first, just for, um, so in general, COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, um, the data has shown sort of nationally, internationally, places all over the US, places outside of the US, whether schools are open, schools are closed, that um, children, particularly uh, younger kids in the elementary school, but also in high school and middle school tend to have COVID, like they're, they, they have an infection with SARS-CoV-2 less frequently than, um, than adults do. Um, and that's probably related to something called the ACE2 receptor, which is basically the the locking the lock mechanism to get into the cell. Basically, the way SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, gets into the cell is by lock glob, glomming onto the ACE2 receptor. If you don't have a whole lot of ACE2 receptors, it's hard for the virus to get into the cell, and therefore the infection doesn't happen. And for whatever reason, children make less ACE2 receptors, therefore less um, locks. Basically, there's no way to turn the, the door handle. Um, and so therefore they don't get uh, infected as frequently. It doesn't mean that they don't get infected ever. It just means that compared to adults, they're less likely, likely to get it. So that means the implications in the school setting is that um, as opposed to our normal mental model where we think the kids are the ones who are gonna make everybody else sick around us, you know, their coughs and their colds. And if the kid gets the cough and the cold, everybody else in the class is gonna get it and the teacher's gonna get it. For COVID-19, we actually think need to remember that the adults are more likely to pass it to each other or the adults are more likely to pass it to the kids. That, those are the patterns that we've seen again in, in schools open around the globe as well as locally and nationally. 
Um, so that's that's sort of where we start at baseline with SARS-CoV-2 or the, the virus that causes COVID-19 before we get to the variant. The variant, it looks like, and this is preliminary data out of the UK, right? So we don't, we don't, the, it's preliminary data about patterns in human beings by age that doesn't, we don't have any school specific information, but the patterns um, sort of overall in the population, it looks like the UK variant is more transmissible. It's easier for it to pass from human being to human being across all different age groups. So it's not that kids all of a sudden are more infectious compared to the way they were before. Like it, it's not like all of a sudden it, may, it looks like a regular old cough and cold where the kids are the ones who are gonna drive the whole thing. But it does mean that in general across the entire population, it's just easier for the virus to, to move from one person to another. Does that clarify yeah, questions? I, does that help? Yeah, I think that that's actually really helpful because um, a follow-up question is naturally uh, the, the new variant has been detected in uh, various states throughout the United States, uh, including California. So if that uh, variant becomes more prevalent, uh, is it possible that the state may have to go into full like, lockdown like we were uh, last spring? Mm -hmm. I think it's one of those things that are really, it's really hard to know exactly what the answer is going to be to that. Um, I, my, my general philosophy about COVID a lot, the whole way through and still now with this new variant is to watch the data very, very carefully and be ready to move very quickly. Um, I feel like we don't, we don't quite know enough and we, um, and, and my understanding talking to some of the state epidemiologists is that it's, it, it's in, it's not very, there's very, very little of it in California right now. So, um, so they're not sort of saying, okay, we have to move on any of it right now. But I, I think that, um, that we just have to be very, very, very evidence-based and very, very data-driven and make sure we're paying close attention to what's going on um, and not sort of sit back and say, oh, it's fine right? Because we already learned our lesson if we do that too much. For sure. Um, now, uh, we were going to uh, talk about transmission as a separate topic, but um, Dr. Patel, I think we've actually covered the questions that came up in transmission. Do you want to uh, move on to the testing topic? Uh, at this yeah, point? I, was, I was thinking that um, I'll do mitigation and then you can end on testing. Okay, sounds great. Okay, yeah. So, um, so for mitigation, uh, I have two, two questions for both Dr. Cutter, Clutter and Dr. Ketterman. Dr. Clutter, you first. Um, we've heard that washing hands for 20 seconds with soap and water is recommended over hand sanitizer. Um, in a classroom with one sink, washing hands in that way can take quite a while. What further can be done to improve hand washing relative to our typical physical plant limitations? I think the question kind of is about uh, hand sanitizer versus washing hands. All right. So, and there, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a that's a tough question. Sounds like a um, <laughs> hard situation with one one sink. Um, so, um, per the C, per the CDC, it, it does um, seem like in general hand uh, washing is kind of um, uh, you know a recommended even preferred approach. Um, for uh, general hand hygiene in the community. Um, but when it's not available um, in a way that's feasible to use and there's you know, serious limitations around its use, it's perfectly fine to use hand sanitizer. Um, you know, there are some benefits over using um, uh, soap and water for washing your hands. Um, it, uh, it, can be, um, you know, more complete in terms of removing um, all types of bacteria um, from your hands. Uh, there are certain viruses and bacteria that uh, tend to um, linger or spread more um, if uh, soap and water are not used. So C. diff, um, crypto, uh, a, back, a couple diarrheal, uh, diarrheal illnesses. So there are some bacteria called Clostridium difficile, um, cryptosporidium and norovirus, um, these are all tend to be better addressed with um, uh, soap and water. Um, and um, 
certainly if your hands are, you know, visibly contaminated, then uh, soap and water is preferred. Um, there's some concern that hand sanitizer not, might not be able to cut through kind of visible grime. Um, and you also want that off your hands. <laughs> um, so uh, there are some instances where um, soap and water is superior, um, but you know, uh, hand, hand sanitizer is the preferred method of hand hygiene in healthcare settings. Um, where COVID is, you know, seen uh, extremely commonly these days um, in patients who are getting um, procedures that are going to result in a lot of secretions of COVID. So clearly it's something we, we feel is active against COVID. You know, there are certain recommendations around the type of hand sanitizer that you use. You want to make sure that it's between 60 and 90, I think 60 and 95% um, alcohol to be effective against um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, but when it's, when it's used appropriately, it's, it, it, with regards to COVID, it's, it's a great option. And you know, the reason it, it's um, kind of preferred in healthcare settings is because it's, um, there's generally just more um, compliance with use. Uh, when you exit a hospital room, there's, um, you know, hand sanitizer pump on the wall. They're just kind of all over the place. So, you know, it's very easy when you're walking into room to just do a pump of gel, go in, same thing on your way out. So just anything you can do to improve uptake and improve compliance is going to be, you know, probably um, w one of the more important things in um, uh, promoting hand hygiene is just making it um, something doable um, on a regular basis. Um, I think, you know, with, with regards to, and it's also, you know, can be a little bit more gentle in the hands. Um, there are, uh, you know, there may be some considerations around children that I'm not aware of. I did read that um, there's kind of concern for um, alcohol poisoning and, you know, kids might be a little bit more susceptible to that. Uh, you know, if there's a colorful or fruit scented hand sanitizer that, you know, I think those sometimes are enticing. So it would be important to make sure that all hand sanitizer use is, you know, observed and it's kept out of reach and that sort of thing. Um, and that, you know, there may be other considerations with using it around kids that I'm not aware of, but otherwise, um, uh, as, as far as just using it to, um, uh, prevent transmission of COVID, it seems like a fine option um, if you're unable to use soap and water in a practical way. There's a follow-up question to that, Dr. Clutter, is um, we've, you know, the, the knowledge regarding transmission from surfaces has sort of evolved in the, in, over, during the pandemic. Do you have any comment on, do, do classroom materials still need to be separated for surfaces? Hmm. Well, um, I think we feel that uh, um, transmission from surfaces uh, is not a huge driver of the pandemic, um, but it's also probably not zero risk. So um, I think, you know, especially like high touch surfaces and items, I think it would be, you know, imp important to still sanitize those. Um, so, you know, things like door handles, um, uh, things like that, that are touched frequently are going to be, you know, need to be wiped down. Um, and then in terms of segregating items that are touched frequently, I would say either, you know, I, I'm less familiar with how, um, the kind of, uh, materials in a classroom circulate, but, you know, um, keeping them kind of having a set of items for each child seems like that would be good or if they're shared kind of disinfecting them I you know I think I think the the feeling is that it the transmission from objects is probably uh not a huge driver but I still think it's um we don't think it's you know zero risk so I would still you know continue those efforts okay maybe thank you maybe can I can I add one other Please um way Please. of thinking about it because i um i would agree i think the 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 way that i've been finding it helpful as we talk through these ideas of you know do we do cleaning do we do disinfection um is to help people remember that um 
because our understanding it in the beginning of the pandemic, we thought it was actually all about surfaces and can, you know, you touch a surface and then you put your, put it on your hand on your face and that's the way you're going to get the, the disease. Now we better, much better understand that it passes mostly through airway, you know, through the, through the air, either in a, in a big respiratory droplet or in a small respiratory droplet. So helping people remember to focus on the masking part, the physical distancing, the hand, the ventilation, um, small stable groups in schools actually. Um, uh, and then also making sure that we think about the hand hygiene and the cleaning. Um, I think it, for me, it always helps to, because it's so complex to implement all these things. I always, I, I agree, like it's still good to be thinking about cleaning high, high frequency um, touch surface surfaces, but that is really helpful for people to remember like, oh, there's a bunch of other things that are, that we should make sure we keep our focus on that. Um, rather than making them all equally like uh, extremely important or sometimes it's actually what's still happening is because we thought it was so important in the beginning of the pandemic people are still focused on cleaning and disinfection as being a really 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 important thing and we just need to help people understand that it's actually if you have to spend like spend less energy and money on those things um, particularly disinfection even the CDC I we I talked to them a week or two ago to ask them actually what their stance is on disinfection and they're they're moving away from disinfection and just more towards cleaning because we know cleaning can actually decrease SARS-CoV-2 pretty pretty effectively, and it doesn't need to actually a disinfectant doesn't need to be used, which can be more harmful to the kids and all that. So, so that's just to help sort of put a little context to people as they think about where am I going to put all you know a lot of time and effort and energy in terms of how are we really going to effectively stop transmission? Where should we put most of our focus? Great, thank you, Dr. Bardick. Yeah. Um, next question in mitigation is for Dr. Ketterman. Two questions. One is that one a little bit about, do you have a comment about a teacher taking their class outside for a brief socially distanced mask break? Um, and then the second one is a little bit just broader. For the younger grades, teachers have to check work, give assistance, hand them something, be near them. Can you talk a little bit about um, uh, the, you know, how that sort of looks is it brief is brief interaction okay um, uh, as long as the student and teacher are masked yeah um so i think um you know we were talking a lot about mask breaks in the beginning of the pandemic or kind of middle of pandemic and what i've been seeing in my patients that are at uh, daycares or uh, camp settings or so forth is I'm not really sure it's necessary to be honest. Like, I think that uh, it's, it's okay. I think it's fine to go outside socially distance. They can take a mask break. Um, we know that the virus is not as easily transmitted outdoors as it is indoors. Um, but you know, of course we do want them to keep their distance if they have their masks off, but, um, you know, we've, I feel like kids these days, most of the patients that I talk to are able to keep their masks on for much of the day. So I don't think as a, group necessarily it's it's going to be um necessary to do that but it's you know i certainly would defer to the teachers with that decision um uh, and then the other question about like getting close to students um you know the mass so basically we're trying to minimize our exposure so we have all these layers of protections the mass distancing and all the stuff that we've been talking about um, I think it's okay to get close to a student for a short period, especially if you're both mass. Um, I would, you know, uh, I think minimize the duration of time that you're spending very in close proximity to them. But if you need to like correct something on their paper or read over their shoulder, I think that's okay. We really like, as um, the other doctors were saying is we want to like avoid breathing on each other, you know, as much as possible. So um, if we're, the more distance, the better. But if we have to get close to someone to to help a young child with with something, um, I think it's perfectly fine. Thank you. We're gonna finally we're gonna move this on to I think which is also another hot topic, which is testing, and that will be this is how we'll be ending. Yeah. So. Um, the testing is uh, something that's been a little bit more in the news recently. Uh, we didn't have a lot of tests originally, um, and now they're coming online, and we're seeing bigger numbers of tests, and so we're seeing some of the benefits, and we're seeing some of the problems with testing. Um, so let's start with, uh, 
either Dr. Clutter or Dr. Bardak on this one. Um, the, uh, there have been uh, some false negatives uh, that have been associated with the curative COVID testing uh, recently reported in the news. Uh, there was an article out of Oakland uh, that specifically drew our attention to this. Um, and so uh, can you talk about the different kinds of COVID-19 tests that are out there and their reliability? Um, and specifically, if you have any knowledge about curative, uh, the, the issue with um, false negatives being called out by the, I think it was the CDC. I can start with this one and feel free to chime in. Um, so uh, I don't have any insight into what exactly was um, uh, kind of raised the flag about curative. Um, so curative, curative is a, um, a molecular test. So it detects you know the gene the genetic material of SARS-CoV-2. Um, Generally, that type of test is um, uh, picks up virus very well um, and reliably. Um, but the use of any test, the performance of any test kind of depends heavily on the population that it's being used in. And so the communication that was released by the FDA um, a little over a week ago um, said, there's, you know, kind of concern about um, false results with the curative test um, with, you know, particular concern about false negative results, um, meaning the test was negative and someone who actually was some uh, later determined to have COVID um, and, or yes, to have COVID. Um, and uh, so that's, that's kind of what, what was released. And then the, um, kind of in, additional information in that communication reminded providers to use it as intended, to use it kind of in the population as intended. And so, um, you know, the population that it's intended to be used in, um, per the kind of instructions, um, are, patients who are suspected to have um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, and so if you're using it in patients who um, are asymptomatic and you don't expect them to have SARS-CoV-2, then it may not perform as well. And so, um, you know, I, again, I don't have the details, but I think, you know, the, the fact that that was highlighted in the communication, um, I think suggests that that's important for maintaining the um, kind of performance that was um, indicated in the, in the test that led to the um, authorization of this test. So, um, so I think maybe that's part of it, but again, I, I don't know. Um, I think it's just reminds us that we need um, in order to kind of uh, rely, uh, to have the reliability uh, of a test match what's um, uh, kind of anticipated based on um, the limited data that we have, we have to kind of use it as intended or, and if we don't, we just need to be aware of that limitation. Um, so I think that that's, that's kind of what I understand. Um, it also kind of indicated that it should be the, when it's collected from saliva or the nose that it should be collected within the first 14 days of symptoms. So, um, you know, the, the amount of virus that someone is shedding tends to be lower and lower the further out you go from when the symptoms started. And so, you know, it's, um, it's possible if it was used outside of that recommendation, then um, maybe you would have um, a higher likelihood of uh, false negative. But I, again, I don't know, that's just kind of speculation. Um, so, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, they're kind of reminding people to use it as intended. Um, but that's not always possible, I think. And, you know, there are a lot of tests out there that are, I think, have, um, you know, potentially really important roles uh, that are meant to only only be used in symptomatic patients, and uh, patients with symptoms of COVID. Of, uh, COVID. Um, but, you know, 
the tests, so I'm thinking of antigen tests. Um, and so those tests are um, fast, uh, easy to do, um, but you know, right now they are recommended generally just to be used in patients um, who have symptoms. Um, but they have, they can be a, a potentially very um, useful test in, in you know, surveillance in areas that might not otherwise be able to get testing. Um, and so I think if you're, I, I think it's been said by um, CDC that, um, I'm not sure if it's CDC or F FDA, but it's been said that um, it's, it's okay to use it off label if you kind of can't otherwise get the testing done, but just consider those limitations of the test. You might be, you know, sacrificing a bit of the test performance if you're using it kind of off label. Um, so that's that's kind of um, my interpretation of what the, the of the communication of, of the about the curative test. Um, any anything to add? Any anyone? Yeah, it reminds me a little bit about the um, initial testing that was done. Uh, in some political organizations and some uh, in, in the NFL where folks were not changing their behavior outside of the testing using the and uh, a lot of reliance on the test itself to tell you whether or not you were truly positive or not, whether you were asymptomatic or not. In other words, um, the test seems to me to be like one aspect of keeping yourself safe and healthy. So potentially we pick up folks that are asymptomatic but have high viral levels but that doesn't preclude you from continuing the behavioral um, mitigation efforts that we've all uh, come to know and adapt. Is that uh, pretty fair to say? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I can jump in on that also because um, I've been helping provide technical assistance and communicating with county health on, um, and also the public health officers um, so when a uh, curative does their training, they tell you right off the bat that there's a, a certain percentage that some test results are going to be false positive and some false negative. The public health officers confirmed that yesterday that's the case with any test that you're going to get. You're always going to get those outside. Um, also, um, so any vendor we use right now would probably have that same element present to some degree. Um, we know that um, Curative is responding to the FDA advisory by, I think, submitting more data. And according to the public health officers, <laughs> they have most of the testing market in California. So they have tons and tons of data um, that the way in which they were going to respond was uh, they felt likely to lead to, you know, be, it being resolved um, with the additional data. Um, the health officers uh, advised us to, um, you know, it's it's a lot more of a problem to step away from the curative testing than it is to stick with it. And I know for our um, our organization, we've we've had lots of uh, positive results um, for people who weren't showing symptoms. Um, so it has really helped us. And um, and I think Dr. Bardak can probably is probably the most uh, you know, um, on the cutting edge of all that's going on with testing in schools. So I'll turn it over. <laughs> I don't mean to pretend to be a doctor. I'm just giving you the uh, policy piece of it. I think the policy like piece is, <laughs> that's right. And I think the policy piece is actually a really important one, which is, um, uh, I also have been following this story about curative because so many schools use curative up and down the state. I think your, your point is extremely well taken. And um, uh, any one of these tests um, is going to have some limitations. Um, so both this idea of having a false positive, meaning that it's positive, uh, the test says you have COVID-19 when, when you don't, or it says that you don't when you do, that's the false negative. And the concern about curative is the false negative situation, which would allow somebody who potentially has COVID-19 to be hanging out with other people and not isolated and then potentially pass it on. So that's why it's a big concern. But um, in a world where many, 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 many people are relying on curative for ongoing testing, and most of the time curative is a pretty accurate test with this one concern, if we all of a sudden take out all of the curative testing that's happening across the state, then we have 
zero testing instead of a test that is slightly flawed. And the way they talk about it is sensitivity. So if the test misses some cases, it's slightly lower sensitivity. So if we got rid of those tests, we would have a zero sensitivity test because we would have no testing at all. So it's important to remember that it's probably better as they figure out this question, you know, is, is this right? Is it wrong? Curative is going to get some more data. It's probably better to leave things in place because hopefully they're going to be able to answer it quickly rather than trying to stop everything right now. So I think that that policy perspective is probably an important one. And I can add two additional details. One is that um, I've heard from districts that um, curative is now coming back and informing a district if they are aware of a false negative with a notification. Um, so that's obviously one response, one way they're responding in the middle of this. And um, what was my second point? Oh yes, my second point was that uh, there are other vendors out there and while you'll have these same issues, um, we are also going to be um, signing on to the uh, Valencia Labs, which is the statewide, uh, they have a statewide contract um, with schools. And so we're opening that up for San Mateo County and um, any district. We're encouraging districts to onboard with Valencia just to have a backup um, in place, um, or they also have choices so they can see which they like better um, as we go forward. Because here's another interesting question about looking ahead. I think we're going to be testing in schools for a while. Um, I, I would ask Dr. Bardak or um, others to comment on, you know, I think this is going to be part of our culture for at least a year or more. No, I would agree. Um, and I'll say one other piece about testing, which is that there's also something called an antigen test. So the tests we just talked about was uh, what they call a PCR or a molecular test. There's also something called an antigen test. And that tends to be, um, sometimes it's a test that can be done right there on the spot, what they call point of care test. And there's a lot of new you know, technology that keeps on rolling out testing technology that is an antigen based test that people are looking to see, could we use a point of care antigen test in the school setting. People make the analogy that it's sometimes it's like a pregnancy test. You can just kind of take the test and get an answer in 15 minutes. Um, that testing technology is not, it's not totally there yet. And it has some of the same limitations we were just talking about, which is that sometimes an antigen test is more likely to miss a case than to, um, than, than to catch every single case that, that um, might be coming through. And so there is a recommendation to have, if you're going to do antigen testing, it tends to be, they say, do it a little bit more frequently. So if you're gonna do it you know, every other week with a PCR or molecular test, then you might wanna do it weekly with an antigen test or um, you know, twice weekly if you're doing it weekly with the PCR test. So um, that you guys might have, people might've heard about that whole idea. There's a guy who's become very famous, a guy named Michael Minna who keeps on saying, we gotta do you know, high frequency antigen tests. Everybody should be doing it every day, you know, home practice pregnancy test. So that's something you might have heard of. And that's the antigen test. And that's its limitation is that um, it's, a, it's not quite as sensitive. And also it, it right now the technology we have requires a level of training to do the test and to read the test and interpret it that makes it a little bit hard for schools to be able to implement super easily. But there are schools in California that are piloting it. So more to come on that. So I always love the way that your brain works, uh, Dr. Bardick, uh, because you just teed me up for the next question, which was how often should we be screening uh, with COVID testing uh, to help improve detection? And I think you just kind of answered that, but um, maybe you could clarify a little bit more. It sounds like every other week for the molecular tests and about weekly for the antibody tests. Uh, it's a it's a little bit of a moving target actually um, uh, and just sorry to clarify one other thing because you just used the word antibody test which is another kind of test that we didn't mention before which is a, an antibody test is a test of of your blood the the molecular the PCR and the antigen is usually a sample from your nose or from your saliva and the antibody test is a sample usually from your blood and it tells you whether you were exposed ever in the past to SARS-CoV-2 or the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, it doesn't tell you whether you actually have the infection right now or not. Um, it also doesn't tell you whether you're protected against getting 
COVID-19, which is a little confusing, but um, sometimes people think, oh, if I have antibodies, that must mean that I, I can't get it. But the, the science is not perfect on that. But that is another test that people use. So that's antibody. Um, and then in terms of how frequently to be doing the testing, it, um, this whole idea of testing, it's another layer of protection that we, that we think about. There's masking, physical distancing, stable cohorts, hand hygiene, ventilation, um, symptom screening, uh, and exposure screening, and then keeping those people out or testing them if they, they have symptoms or have been exposed. And then the last layer or, or the last layer in my list right now is the asymptomatic testing. And asymptomatic testing means you just on a regular basis, on a standing schedule, you test a, you know people in a population um, when they even when they don't have symptoms because we know that sometimes um, people have COVID-19 and they have zero symptoms and they can pass it on to other people. So that's the goal behind that ongoing asymptomatic testing. And there's um, two ways that people think about it. One is called surveillance, which means basically just taking a snapshot in time, maybe of a subsample, a, you know, a, a 10% or 20% of the people in the school to see what's going on in the school population. You know, is there infection going on that we're not detecting? Or are we kind of okay? Because, you know, maybe our community rates are pretty low. We just want to get a little snapshot. That kind of testing is not going to keep out every single case of COVID-19. So the other kind of testing people talk about is screening testing, which is you're actually screening every single person in your population to try and figure out where are the cases. Let's stop as many cases we possibly can from ever walking through the door. That kind of testing you can imagine would be more important when you have higher community rates. And also um, you're gonna do that at a higher frequency. So that's the weekly or sometimes even people talk about twice weekly and the college campuses, they're often doing it twice weekly because their rates are so high and because they live in residence halls and that's like a vertical cruise ship, right? So, um, so uh, in, the, in the school based setting, the recommendation for how frequently you're going to do that is going to depend a little bit on you, what your community rates are and also what your testing capacity is. Because if you don't have a very high testing capacity in your community, schools tend to be slightly lower. You know, it tends to be that they're not a place of lots and lots of COVID compared to jails or nursing homes where you, that's where from a policy level, people might have to put those tests, a limited testing capacity. But like I said, as we're growing our testing capacity, then that's when we start thinking about doing surveillance and screening testing. Great, that was so very helpful. And um, I'm gonna uh, throw out one last question, uh, which uh, I think is a germane one, probably lived in a different category. And uh, the question has to do with uh, children and the COVID-19 vaccine. So, you know, uh, if you're gonna uh, vaccinate the adults, why aren't we vaccinate the, vaccinating the children? Um, yeah, the, the two populations would be mixing. Uh, so it seems like we should be doing both. And uh, I'll leave that open to the group, to anybody who has insight into that. I think right now, uh, they're the Moderna and Pfizer, the only two uh, vaccines with an EUA, with an um, authorization to use in the US and uh, they're not approved for children. Although I think Pfizer goes down to age 16. Um, 16. Okay. So I think that's the main reason it's not happening now, but um, you know, I think it's certainly in the works. Yeah, the goal is certainly to vaccinate kids too. We just have to do the studies first. And so the next step is they're gonna start studying or perhaps already have, I'm not sure. Maybe just um, the other doctors know, but 12 to 16. And then after that, they'll start studying the younger kids. You're saying that the safety profile data is not, and efficacy data is not there yet. Right. Yeah, I think what, what I've heard is that they are, uh, uh, or what I've read is that they are studying down to 12, that's in place with some sort of, uh, don't quote me on this, but loose idea that by tw that 12 might be available later this year. Uh, perhaps around the time that school opens, um, uh, possibly. Um, but for the younger than 12, uh, one thing to know about that is it's just, it's very difficult to study that population. And it takes time to study that population. And there really isn't a compelling need to study that population because it is the, 
population that, that gets COVID the least compared to the, the adult population. So we will rely on the safety profiles that we see in the 12 and older population to help inform that and then actually study them, study the younger kids slowly. So, um, it may, so the, what I've read is 2022 for really young children. So I, I uh, uh, unfortunately, we're just about out of time here. It's uh, 4.27 and we are scheduled to go to 4.30. Um, I'm always amazed by how compelling and engaging these panel discussions are. They fly by uh, from my perspective. I'm not sure about you guys, but for me, that was like five <laughs> minutes. Um, and so uh, I think we just really want to thank you guys for being here and um, making yourself available and uh, being so approachable in terms of your um, willingness to uh, communicate with our, our district and our public. Um, and um, I guess, I, again, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, all the effort you guys are putting into um, making sure that uh, we work through this problem as a community as and uh, look towards low risk environments as we move forward. Uh, and Dr. Patel, I think you had some cl closing comments too. Yeah, no, I think it's the, the same. Thank you to the panelists um, uh, for sharing the, the gift of time. And then also thank you to everybody who's on the call listening as well. Um, we know that, we, uh, just please know that we're in this together and, um, and we'll keep going. So uh, I wanna thank the distinguished group and um, I'll turn it over to Dan for final closing comments. Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Patel. And uh, thank you to our panel. Uh, it, I'm going to echo what uh, Dr. Howard said. It always is. The time does go by so quick. And I, I learn so much um, each time I, I participate in one of these panels. As a superintendent, I thought, never thought I was going to be uh, so versed in uh, medical screening, testing, and um, SARS-CoV-2 transmission, right? <laughs> so um, thank you all for um, helping um, educate us um, for all of our folks in the audience, I just want to share a couple of things. Uh, we have been recording this panel um, and we will post it on the BRSSD website. I will share links with all of the superintendents across the county. Um, we've also uh, set up a, a Google collection form. If you have any additional questions that you'd like to submit, um, I will share those questions with superintendents as well as, and that'll help us uh, collectively uh, uh, better address uh, the educator concerns. Uh, the link is, um, I put it in the chat. Uh, I know uh, quite a number of folks are listening on YouTube. It's http colon uh, forward slash forward slash, it's a bit.ly link, bit.ly uh, forward slash educator questions. I made it easy for everybody. That's http colon forward slash forward slash bit.ly uh, forward slash educator question. So please submit those questions. Uh, we'll do our best uh, to respond to those and, and use those questions to help uh, inform our uh, future work. Also, I wanna note um, that Superintendent McGee and the San Mateo County Office of Education is organizing additional um, webinars focused on school reopening. Uh, we'll share those um, as those dates um, are solidified and topics are, are identified. Uh, it's part of the uh, county office's uh, Better Together series. So uh, thank you, Superintendent McGee, for organizing that. And with that, I just want to give uh, one last thank you uh, to our panelists uh, for joining us. Um, as Dr. Patel was saying, um, time is precious. We know there's so much going on with, with, with work, families, and, and these extra things that you've taken on. Thank you for giving us uh, uh, the gift of time. So thank you very much. And um, uh, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you guys thank for you. organizing. Thank you. Take care. Have a good Everyone. evening all. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.